let's start with the numbers. Since um, how many, how big is your archive? It's big. <laughs> um, I have approximately one million rolls of music films, film, and tons of documentaries, feature films, name it. Uh, my, my eldest film is from 1894, in color. 1894? Yes. What, what is it? It's a serpentine dance. It's a dancing lady, and it, it's in color. And how did you find it? By accident, somewhere in France, years ago. Yeah. Are you, uh, when you go to, uh, because you travel uh, around the globe, and um, are you always, uh, how do you say that, open and censored for new items? Obviously I am. Obviously I am. That's, uh, wherever I come, I manage to find film. Yeah. That's, uh, my work is my hobby. So I'm a collector. So you always manage to find film somewhere. And when does it um, get the uh, approval to be, be in your archive? What are the criteria? Yes, well, I haven't got any criteria anymore. Basically, I try to get anything I get, and then I'll go and have a look. I prefer private, private shot films, so non-commercial shot films, or commercial shot films, which are made by very small production companies. Because, for example, you have those B-movies in the, uh, from 1930s and 40s in America. Sometimes you see shadows, you see the microphone in the picture. Fantastic. All those old Bela Lugosi films. Fantastic. That's all low budget made. And I love it when I see a mic somewhere in, in the picture. Because then you know it's low budget. It's, it's different. And is it, um, I hope you are insured? You can't insure it. You can't insure it? No, film you can't insure because that's uh, ridiculous prices. So basically my archives at various places because one moment we had in Amsterdam a plane coming down in the Belmermeer. And at that moment I started thinking, well, you know, it might happen to my archive. So now I have uh, bits and pieces in, uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, in Kiev, in, uh, in Paris, in Berlin, London, Milan. Oh, it's everywhere. Uh, and um, is it all in your head or is it also digitalized? Not everything is digitalized yet. It's all in the head because you, I keep on buying. Every day is new stuff coming in. And whenever, at the moment I start digitalizing it, then I'll put it in my laptop. And then it's always in the head because I am busy with film. So I manage to keep track somehow what I have. Sometimes I have some difficulties fi finding it. It costs me a week, or sometimes two weeks, because then I lose it in my own archive. But it doesn't matter, you know, that's, uh, it keeps it uh, interesting. And is it because um, today, of course, we live in a digital era and uh, there is a lot uh, published on the internet, yeah. uh, which nobody really has responsible for saving it. Yeah. Does it worry you that a lot get, gets lost? Yeah, but it's those digital formats, I have nothing with. Because basically, I think film is film. And uh, of course, I make it digital. But these days, people have, uh, with the telephones, they're making uh, little movies. But there's no quality. You know, it's uh, for me, it's not really. Why? Real. Why is then the, the film so special? Film, color, and basically the color, because when I'm transferring old film, I have a new scanner specially built for me, and I managed to get the real colors from then digital. And that's very difficult these days, because, you know, it's, uh, you have to have the right scanners. Yeah. And is it because, well, you say you have the real colors, and of course, uh, those are times um, we haven't experienced, and yes. it's all history, so it's, uh, uh, of course, an archive is history. What, what has, yeah, what has it teached you? It teached me that you can expect anything in life. For example, uh, about five years ago, I bought 12 hours uh, home movies from uh, a family in Iowa, and it was a farmer, and his sister was a nun. So I have shots of a nun uh, driving on a tractor, driving a horse, uh, uh, working in the kitchen, uh, you know, and those shots you do not find anywhere because only a nun in, in a film, you never see a nun in the kitchen or hoovering the house or name it, you know, and that in those private films you, you find it. And that it's fantastic to see. It is, but how did you find, uh, it's an amazing story, how, how did you find the family in Iowa, how did you knew that? Uh, 
I have contacts all over the world and I get phone calls and so through the internet I have all kind of contacts and then uh, they call me and say, well, you know, I know 12 hours 8 mil material, so I'll buy it. No, no, buy it. And you just Blind. get a Blind. plane ticket, go there and buy it? Or well, they send the, it to you? These days you can uh, have it sent to you. It's ah. easy. Before, if it's really exclusive material, I'll buy a plane ticket and I go. For example, um, I bought the first farewell concert from Frank Sinatra from 1971. And the filmmaker made it illegally. He was at, a, at, at that concert, he was filming it illegally. So he sold it for a lot of money to, to me. Obviously, I went with cash in the plane and picked it up. And how is the moment if a package arrives to you? Um, how, how, how does, how does it make you feel? First time I really got excited. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> These days, I packed them in a room because there's so much coming in that I think I have to become 500 years in age to digitalize everything. Yeah. Because it's, uh, content is so important. And people forget that you have to get content. True. And, that's that's uh, and one moment the film is gone because there's no new film coming. So also in Russia, I, I, I find a lot of private material in Ukraine. I found fantastic stuff. I go to those places where nobody expects that I walk around. And then uh, in the future, you're going to see it. Oh, amazing. And um, of course, here you are uh, for Scopino. You have a Bowie night uh, during the festival. Every, every day we play uh, a Bowie clip. And I've surprised already many people uh, uh, with exclusive Bowie material. Because basically, uh, I had a relation with Bowie. Because uh, I, have to, I have to explain this. In 1995, I was working, uh, we were setting up a TV station in, uh, in Germany, VH1. And it happened that the lounge party was at the 4th of May, mm. 1995. And it was at 8 o'clock in the evening. So I was in, uh, in Hamburg. And Bowie had to open it. I had to go on stage as well. And I said to David, as a Dutch person, I cannot go on the 4th of May at 8 o'clock on stage. Because we think of, at that moment, at the death of World War II and all other wars. So two minutes after 8, the uh, station started. Very nervous German people since then. And Bowie saved my marriage. Because of those days I was married, I knew if I go on stage, my wife will never forgive me. And is it because um, when he uh, passed away, is then your phone constantly ringing for people who want uh, clips yeah. and material? Yes, but I uh, didn't want to do that. I said, uh, get the clip through the management of Bowie. And I went on television with a friendly TV station and I said, listen, I don't want to talk private things. I mm -hmm. just want to place some respect to Bowie and that's it. You know? So I did it for three minutes. That's it. Because suddenly all kinds of people were appearing on television Talking about Bowie, I don't think that uh, you should do that. No. You, you should play spec to somebody. And is it, hmm? can, uh, because I can imagine if you have this archive and uh, somebody, um, uh, there is this loss that you maybe dive into it for some comfort. Hmm. Yes, and I get ideas out of my own archive because uh, as I, I have a very wide range of materials which I'm buying because uh, I'm interested in film. Uh, I can make, basically I'm making my own work because we make documentaries uh, for television, you know, and sometimes uh, special things at film festivals. And also in the Scopitan Cafe, every day I do a different presentation which goes a little bit with the music documentary which we are showing that day. Mm -hmm. And that's so much fun to do because all the time I have to use my grey mask. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, I can't sit, I don't like sitting back comfortable and uh, have a commercial business. It's, uh, you also have to think of the artistic way of doing it. Yeah, and while you mentioned that, <coughs> it's this artistic way, and you said earlier that you also work for the Naughty Jazz, and it's also about r raising your audience a bit. Yes, because I have my own audience. Uh, the people coming back every year and they say, what do we have this year? So, surprise, surprise, you know, because I like teasing, and it's very nice if I manage to tease my public a little bit, and my public can also tease me. That's How do they do that? I try to have it interactive. For example, uh, people can talk, and for example, I make a, a television program in the Netherlands called Night of the Pop Music, which was the first interactive television program in the Netherlands. Because basically the idea is I'm in a hotel room, I have 35,000 DVD discs with me, with music material, we put a list on the internet, people can search in the database on the internet, and everybody who has a right story, 
they can react through the internet and we're going to call them. And they are live in the... And that's, this was interactive, this interactive television. I think interactive is the nicest thing there is because you never know what you can expect. Yeah. You know? And that's, I like that. Yeah. Because then it, people know it's real. You know, it's, 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 it's not a format uh, uh, with auto cue and everything. No, it's live, it's real. And what is it for the youngsters yeah. nowadays that uh, who are being raised? Um, well, maybe let's start with uh, being raised without Bowie. Like mm -hmm. this artist, what would you, uh, with what you know of him and his um, music and legacy, what would you um, uh, say to them, leave them with? Listen to his uh, material for, and uh, listen to the elderly people who can tell the stories. For example, Ziggy Stardust, the alter ego of Ziggy Stardust, the feature film, is Finn Taylor. Finn Taylor was a British guy who got famous in France in the early 60s. but. He became the boyfriend from Brigitte Bardot. He was a very, but he was also the first one knocking equipment into pieces on stage, which the Who copied later. You know, so we have to tell our stories, and not all the right stories are on the internet. Uh, the young people should listen to the elderly people, and that, that's why I think it's not important that I do and tell little stories I know, uh, which happened to me or about film. We we carry it on, yeah. like in. in previous time you also had the storytellers. It's so important. And is it, um, you're, you have children, yes. um, are they open for that or do they think sometimes, oh dad, please? Oh no, they're very open uh, for it because uh, my younger son is uh, this grafisch uh, museum, uh, video editing, but he loves photography even more. So now he's doing photography and of course with his father he can go to places where he can go backstage and make the pictures, but you need the eye. He has to do it. I can bring him to the place and then he has to do it. And he's, he's very good at it. And for example, when he was a young kid, he was watching Flintstones uh, cartoons on my cutting tables. Because I had Flintstones on 60 mil. And then you, you park a child, you switch uh, the cutting table on. And the young ch children learn how to use that old equipment. Yeah. Which is important because wherever they come in, in the studio, and uh, somebody says, ah, I'll help you. you know, and then uh, they can put a film on. And when was, because when you, you s collected things when you were a kid yourself, but when was the moment that you thought, hey, this could actually uh, be a living? Um, well, as a young boy, by accident, I came, uh, got in contact with Linda McCartney, the wife of uh, Paul McCartney, so I went with them on tour. And as, as I was a photographer, you know, I was making the pictures, and one moment somebody gave me a 60 mil camera and said, listen, you know all about light. Yeah shoot because we, we need the extra cameraman so i was shooting i learned filming and it's it's funny doing a live concert learning the filming you know and that's uh, and why not it's uh, and that's how it went on and on and then i went to came into the tv world and i create basically my own living these days by uh, making uh, work yeah and getting ideas yeah how do you get ideas it's very easy you sit back with some friends you open a bottle of wine, uh, <laughs> you have some cheese, and you sit back. And that's how we got that uh, TV program, Night of the Pop Music. Because it's a unique program, which only in Holland, we are the only country in the world where we can do it. Because that's, uh, the rest of the world is too afraid of doing it. Why? I'm there with 35,000 DVD discs, and I can put anything on the air. Because I have so many contacts in the music world, you know. If you play Beatles, the Monday after, I I the rights are fixed, you know, it was, uh, or uh, during the broadcast we fixed the rights because I know how to send mails, SMS, and uh, I have a lot of credit in the music uh, business and also in the film business basically. That's uh, because it's nice to surprise, yeah. also the business. And that's what we do at the Scopitone Cafe at, uh, in the Schouwburg. We are surprising the public and the business. Yeah. For example, last year. I was putting one of those film jukeboxes. Film jukeboxes, uh, they were parked at uh, cafes in the 1960s and 70s. And they were filming it, you could put a dime in it, and then there was a projector taking a film and playing it. We, had, we were the f only ones playing real film at the festival. And I was telling that to the public, and then the public looked at me and said, listen. And then you uh, switch the jukebox on, you can hear the projector going. And then the public could have a look at the backside and see basically how it was working. And basically, we were only ones playing real film because everything is digital at the festival these days. 
And that's, that is a little bit the wink to the business, you know? Hey, come on, we have a real film here. It's fun. And you, uh, uh, you live in Holland, right? Or yeah. In, yeah, in Holland. Uh, do you have these, these film evenings yourself at home? Yes, but sometimes uh, cinemas ask me, so please come and, uh, can you come and do an evening? And then uh, I go there and uh, do an evening about the subject. And that's, uh, for me, it's fantastic. I like it. Because then you keep, you have your contact with the public. And then you know what goes on in the mind of the people. And so what's next? There is, in February, there is the David Bowie night in Groningen? Yeah, uh, yes, because that's, that wasn't fixed before he died. So that's, uh, I'll do that. And then after that, the next one, um, I have some t television things because I also make television in Russia. So that's uh, then I have 200 million, 250 million viewers. So that's uh, a little bit more than in the Netherlands. And we try to set it up. And what, what do you want to show them in Russia? Well, a kind of request program. So we want to try to make it interactive. Uh, that's why I have to go and search and check the business, how we can do it, how many computers are there. Because basically, um, I want to show them Western life in Soviet times, because they have a, a wrong view about the Western world uh, in the previous uh, Soviet times, as we have the wrong view of Russia in the Soviet times. Because uh, my girlfriend is a Jewish uh, a Russian lady from Kazakhstan, and from her I hear now all kind of uh, basically, I uh, hear new history for me, because then I said, listen, uh, this and this and this was going on in Russia. No, she says, you have the wrong idea, you learned it wrong. It was, it was this way and that way. So, hang on, teach me. So, from, we had the Iron Curtain, but there was a real Iron Curtain. So for me, it's now very, I am now in a new country, uh, finding everything, history back. Don't you teach also? Oh, yes. One moment, uh, I'll, uh, they asked me, so, uh, why don't you go and uh, go to schools and t uh, do a few gigs, you know, gigs, uh, the young students tell the stories, and maybe I'm going to do that. That's, uh, because I think I ha the stories has have to be told further. And you have to also explain to the youth that if you want something, you can do it, you know? If you really have to drive and go, anything can be done. You don't have to uh, depend on other people. You only can depend on yourself. That's important. It's a good lesson. Yeah. It's a good lesson. Thank you. I want to close with that. It's the perfect ending. Thank you. Thanks for All your right. time.